Hi everyone. Um, I hope you're all having a great day. Um, welcome to our panel on higher ed redefining education in the AI era. Um, that is STEM. Um, so my name is Aditya. I'm currently a rising junior studying mathematics and computer science at Cornell University, and I'll be the moderator for today's panel. Um, just to let the audience know, we do have a Q&A box in the menu, um, and if you'd and if you have any questions you'd like our speakers to answer, then you can um, drop them in that box, and then um, we'll ask as many as we can in the, in the last ten minutes of our panel. Um, I guess we'll move forward with the speaker introductions. So our first speaker for today is Dr. Lawrence Sangrave, who is an award-winning teaching professor in the computer science department at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, his research includes innovative teaching, playful learning, security, and creating opportunities for accessible and inclusive, and inclusive equitable education. Um, our second speaker today is Dr. Michael Twydale, who is a professor in the School of Information Science, also at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His research interests are at the intersection of computer-supported cooperative work, computer-supported co collaborative learning, human-computer interaction, and socio-technical systems des design. Um, our final speaker for today for this panel is Dr. Shayan Durudi, who is an assistant, assistant professor at the University of California, Irvine, um, in their School of Education and the Department of Inf Informatics. And his research lies at the intersection of the learning sciences, educational technology, and educational data, data science. Um, so without further, further ado, we can get started with the presentations. Um, if Dr. Lawrence Sangrave is ready to go, we can get started with his presentation. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. Um, okay. Okay, great. Uh, if you could give me like a two minute warning or something like that at the end. Um, so I want this to be a, a somewhat interactive session. I've got some notes, I've got some things I can show on screen, um, but I deliberately did not actually prepare any slides because I'm actually hoping to kind of uh, help address questions. So um, please, please kind of put in your questions and thoughts and, uh, right now into the chat, um, because I actually hope to kind of answer them kind of uh, over the next, do you say like I've got 15 minutes or so plus later Q&A? Okay, um, so whilst you're thinking about your question, I've got a question for you, is to, which is like, how many of you today have actually used uh, chat GPT for some kind of educational reason um so so let me know perhaps what you did um and uh okay we got guys I've seen some hands go up um great uh now let me ask a different question uh how many of you have not used uh any of these generative AI uh tools at all so no chat GPT kind of nothing else like that okay all right so we've got a mixture of of, of viewpoints in here all right so um lots of things first of all I assume that you've been kind of following along some of the other sessions so I applaud all the, the the past speakers, uh, both uh, those that came from the University of Illinois, like me, uh, and from other places too. Um, yes, we live in exciting times, and uh, half the things that you're going to learn today uh, will be true in a year's time. Uh, but I can't tell you which half, <laughs> in the sense that look, this thing, this stuff is moving quickly, um, and there's a lot of predictions, uh, both good and bad, um, which may or may not come to fruition. So, for example, today you've probably heard about hallucinations. This is a real problem today that these models are trained on uh, gigantic amounts of text uh, and will happily spit out things which are coherent um, but wrong. Um, so, for example, I've been working on some research with uh, others here um, and at other institutions uh, to look at, say, question generation. Question generation. Um, unfortunately, uh, even with the best of prompts, uh, it might generate questions which are not actually connected to the specific learning objectives or connected to the specific um, content that you've just given it. It might, for example, uh, be would start generating questions based on its prior uh, learning stuff. So, what can we do about this? Well, we can throw our hands up and say, "Okay, great. Uh, we can't. No, that's no. We can do better than that. We can actually use ChatGPT and other models to kind of uh, to actually be critical of themselves." Um, 
it's not perfect, but but already we're seeing a kind of a level of complexity that we didn't have a, a, a year ago in terms of how, how these models are working. A second thing I think which is important, which was also mentioned today, was a question of, of inequity. So I have been looking at a kind of accessibility research, and I'm excited to show you some of those things, both in terms of what it can mean uh, in terms of making things like more inclusive. So how can we make uh, our materials uh, be available in multiple different formats, say both in video and in book form with, with almost no effort from a, 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 a faculty member, for example, but also in terms of inspiring students. Um, I think one of the things that uh, should be shining through the presentations, and I'm not sure it is, but, but it's certainly been mentioned, is that we need, really need to think about um, how we engage students, how we excite students, uh, how we motivate students, uh, because, um, you know, Brains are lazy, right? We don't want to learn stuff. We don't want to do stuff. There's many other things that we'd like to do with our time. So actually, uh, probably one of the most important things we need to think about today is how do we engage students? Um, as faculty, we're often guilty of thinking about, oh, just assuming that all students are like ourselves, right? They have the, like, have the same fortunate backgrounds, for example, um, or same gender, or uh, overcame the same challenges. And actually, as educators, uh, I'd say that our biggest challenge today is to think about, okay, no, I've got a diverse set of students. Possibly, for example, um, they might have just come through a pandemic where it was actually hard to learn about things. Um, uh, and there may be gaps in their knowledge, um, and they may have different interests, etc. We need to play this field right so so uh to, to draw a hollywood analogy today you know we need to do our own stunts we need to do be our own script writer we need to etc do all of these things but our purpose is to actually get ex uh, students implicitly excited about um uh, about learning materials um and a second thing which i which i do think has come through today um so far has been the idea of being critical of, of these tools. Uh, yes, they spit out stuff, which actually can be very good to, to overcome the blank page problem. Um, and I encourage um, uh, educators to actually use this when thinking about, say, designing new exam questions. So, you know, I don't know about you, but about, you know, two weeks or two days before the, uh, the exa final exam is supposed to be due, for example, and I'm trying to think, oh, I need to make another question, which is exactly the same difficulty as last year, but kind of new, et cetera, et cetera. These tools can actually be helpful for me to be creative in trying to kind of to just get off that uh, that first blank page problem. Um, often I don't agree with what it says, um, or it's too general, um, or it's not quite right, but it's given me a bouncing off point to actually kind of generate better assessment materials. Um, and then uh, whilst I'm talking about assessment materials, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna comment, I think assessments actually have uh, three purposes. Usually people only talk about two. One is the kind of form, so the first two are like formative and, and summative ideas, right? So uh, we, we want to help students learn. Um, and, and, and so we, we ask questions and assessments to say, okay, go and work on this thing. Um, and we know that, uh, okay, uh, in, in working on this thing, they will actually uh, have this side effect called learning. Uh, second is we want to bless you with a degree, say an engineering degree, so that your bridges don't fall down or your trains stay on the rails or, or whatever STEM thing or, or your, your chemistry is good, right? Uh, we actually want to show that, that you are accredited in some way um, to actually kind of deserve that title. Um, and so uh, we have these assessments in at Illinois now. We have um, uh, kind of uh, digital assessments with, with lockdown IT, et cetera, like that. And we can do this at scale, right? So we can actually say the student knows something um but but actually i want to comment there's actually a third op, third idea which is used more in k-12 um which is to point out ignorance to point out which is part of motivation right is to point out to someone that you don't know something um i still have nightmares about one of my physics exams many many years ago as a student where i read over past papers and thought oh yeah this all looks easy and etc and i got into the exam and realized that i had actually practiced anything I would simply read the results. I'd simply seen the solutions. I hadn't actually worked through it. And that was a great learning moment for me to say, oh, it, actually, if I want to learn this stuff, I actually have to get involved with it. Um, and so I want us to think about that in terms of like how we design our current assignments today. And I want to think about in terms of how we actually set higher expectations for our students today. Um, now with these tools, we can accomplish things in two minutes that previously took two days or uh, took a prompt instead of taking you know, two pages of, say, uh, graphing stuff in order to generate a nice publication-worthy plot. Um, now I can kind of very quickly make 
make these things. And so I think we should hold our students to, to higher standards in terms of the projects that they make. Um, and, and I know I'm running out of time. So the, 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 I, so I'll, I'll say one more thing. Um, okay, so how is it different from a uh, specific use of formative? Okay, all right, it is actually in the formative assessment, but I, but I wanna highlight it because, um, because I, I think it's an underused view of, of, of assessments. So really it's, it's a use case um, because usually when we think about assessments, we go, oh, we just want people to, 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 to learn. And so we think about that mode versus, oh, we want to, 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 to qualify them. Um, so, so really, no, it's like, no, we want to put in assessments early before they even learn the material, right? As a way to say, you cannot do this, right? You are unable to change a tire today. I know you've watched a YouTube video on it, but you cannot actually change a tire, right? Um, that kind of thing. So actually, use that as a motivator. And that's going to, going to be a theme of this. So I've been talking about motivation for a bit. Let me, uh, in the limited time remaining, uh, let's just um, also kind of sh uh, share some kind of fun things that my students have been doing with AI. So there's been a focus on um, generative um, AI stuff that can generate things. There's other kinds of AI going on as well. Um, so for example, wouldn't it be cool if uh, all of your videos had accurate captions? So that's something we started in uh, Illinois a while ago um, as an open source project. I get computer science students and other students involved with this. Um, it's exciting because we can talk about uh, how to make this um, part of an accessible uh, education. So how can we make education work better for, for everyone? Um, and by the way, if you do this, it also means you can do things like, uh, let's just kind of start this up. Uh, you know, I, I can actually kind of have smart glasses, for example, and what you're seeing now is kind of the captions which I can appear. So if I'm watching a physics lecture, uh, I can watch all the hand gestures and everything else uh, and see this. So that's, for example, as a, as a student project that's been going on for a few years at class uh, at, 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 at Illinois called Scribe AR. Um, uh, but, the other stuff I want to move this down um, is imagine you've got, um, okay, let's say a lecture. Um, now we know that these tools are not perfect, but they can do interesting things, right? So they can, for example, make uh, captions. So if you're hard of hearing uh, or if you're easily distracted, um, it's great to be, or um, you, you, you have, um, dyslexia, it's useful to be able to kind of read the transcripts with some spacing, for example. Um, uh, but also, maybe we want to change the brightness and contrast and color mapping uh, of the video and stuff. So, so we can make a more accessible tool. Um, but once we've got this, now we can use AI to do some really fun things. So I, I, I guess I want to kind of finish with this. It's like, well, what if we made a book? What if we actually made an instant book from our, our videos? And so this is kind of the stuff, the AI stuff, that our students now are kind of capable of, 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 of doing. So once you take um, a video, why can't I turn it into a book and then you know have it as an EPUB or PDF and that kind of thing? Um, so you know if there's more time, perhaps I'll kind of go into that. I just need to stop it from talking. <laughs> Okay, um, but I'm, I'm, I, I guess I want to finish and say, uh, yeah, it's an exciting time and we need to embrace this. And if you're not ready to embrace it in your main course, look for ways to embrace it, say, through independent study credit or senior thesis or little kind of add-ons or bonuses, et cetera, just to kind of take that first dip into this and be excited and, and uh, be as excited as the students are about this, because I think we live in exciting times. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Angrave. Um, I think we can now move on to Dr. Michael Twydale. And as I said earlier, um, if anyone from the audience has questions, please feel free to drop it in the chat now because I think the Q&A box is in working and we can ask the speakers those questions towards the end. Thank you. Okay. So firstly, um, hopefully you can see my um, slides. So um, I just want to focus on one area of making sense of any new technology, any aspect of artificial intelligence or large language models like ChatGPT or anything else. Um, how do we make sense of a new thing? We compare it with things that we already know. So that's sort of loosely uh, about using metaphors. And what I want to sort of share with you today is some of the metaphors that we see people using, but also encourage you to think about what are the metaphors you use to make sense of things when you encounter new technology and what are the metaphors you might give to somebody else. Um, so, for example, uh, my doctoral student was having his hair cut and his barber said, what is this chat GPT thing? 
And so my doctor student, while he was having his hair cut, had to explain large language models to his barber. It's got that sort of popular. This is no longer just some esoteric thing for people at universities. Ordinary people who cut people's hair are also really interested in the concepts of AI, but don't want a lecture. They want it to be explained to them in accessible ways. And I think we can do that if we put our minds to it. So metaphors are everywhere. Whenever you're learning something new, if you think of something like email, um, you've grown up with it. I remember when email was new. What is it? It's like the mail, but E for electronic. It's a metaphor. Um, so there are a load of metaphors. Very often they become so pervasive we don't even see them anymore. So some metaphors are very explicit, some are implicit. Um, often people are just not even aware that they're using uh, metaphors. So we sort of have to look a bit more carefully to see them. And it's worth, um, what I'm interested in is trying to find out, well, what are the metaphors we see for we using? What are the metaphors that we use in teaching or explaining what metaphors we should use? And um, how do metaphors that are helpful help people? Um, but there are some metaphors that aren't very helpful. So how do they hinder things? Um, this is a very famous paper um, in the world of large language models. So this is the use of a metaphor in a research paper um, where the authors were saying, oh, what is this thing, large language model? It's like a stochastic parrot. Um, what do they mean by that? Well, um, parrots can use language, but we're not too sure they actually understand what it is that they're saying. They parrot it back to us. Um, and the stochastic, if you know what that means, sort of sort of random. So it's like a parrot that talks at random. Is so they're saying that's one of many, many ways of looking at large language models. So this metaphor is effective in talking about one aspect of large language models that they might appear to understand things just like a parrot appears to understand things but maybe it doesn't but they also show a weakness if you don't know what stochastic means it's not a very helpful metaphor for you so there's a ton of metaphors out there um, in both uh, the academic literature in teaching and indeed in popular media and they range from things that are somewhat helpful it's, like, well, it's basically a glorified autocomplete or it, you know, it's like a pocket calculator. Pocket calculators um, were a really scary thing when I was a student and my maths teacher was saying, oh, it's gonna be the dead effort maths. All these kids won't be doing mental arithmetic anymore. It's the end of civilization, we you know it. Maybe it's like a pocket calculator for writing, or maybe it's like a cheat sheet or a friend that takes an exam for you. Or maybe it's like a butler or a secretary or assistant or an office junior. And then there are the doom and gloom articles you may have read. It's like, oh, it's like fire. It's like the steam engine. It's going to change the whole economy. It's like the automobile. You know, it's like a genie that's let out of a bottle. It's like an atomic bomb. It's like God. It's like the Terminator. So all these sorts of metaphors, some helpful, some unhelpful, some very scary. Each one of them only de de describes one aspect, one perspective of these very complicated things, but they are complicated. So lots of metaphors can actually help if they're useful. Um, working with my doctoral student, Smith, he's the one who had the conversation with the barber. He decided to do an autoethnography of him using chat GPT for pretty much everything you could think of for an entire month. And he wrote down all of those examples. And then we analyzed them and said, well, what are the patterns that we see? Some of the things he used it for were really quite helpful. Some were utterly useless. And he, some were just goofing around. So he did this one month autoethnography, got loads and loads of um, use cases. Then we looked for patterns. And we found three metaphors that we kind of made up that seemed to emerge out of this. So these were not metaphors he had. These are metaphors that are implicit in, that helped account for a lot of his activity. So the first was when he was using chat GPT, kind of like as a dull, reliable sidekick, as a sounding board. It was like for uh, admin emails or to get, you know, check his grammar, tone of voice, or to get to see what it is that ordinary people might be thinking about. So you can do, you know, like a lot of people think this. Chat GPT is really good at that because that's how large language models work. They collect lots and lots of information. So we thought, oh, what's a metaphor for that? Oh, I don't know, sidekick. Oh, let's ask Chat GPT for some movie sidekicks. Uh, oh, Dr. Watson, thank you very much, Chat GPT. How Sherlock Holmes uses Dr. Watson, firstly to do the boring writing up of his stories for him, but also Watson is like all of us, he's a bit slower than Sherlock Holmes. So Sherlock Holmes likes to show off, makes Holmes feel clever, but also to get the sense of what is it that ordinary people think, because he's a you know, super clever person and it gives him a headache thinking down to our level. So that's the first one. 
Second one is um, ChatGPT is an unreliable narrator, a very creative storyteller that makes stuff up really good for ideas, really good for generating you know, novel things, really good for creative writing, absolutely dreadful for literature reviews or medical advice to make things up. And again, we asked ChatGPT, you know, who is one of these unreliable narrators? Uh, and it suggested one that Smith and I really liked because we had seen the movie, The Usual Suspects, and Kaiser Sose, when he's being interviewed by the police, has to invent stories. And he looks around the room in, where he's being interviewed and that gives him ideas to make things up. So if you know the movie, um, The Usual Suspects, that is a powerful metaphor. If you don't, it's useless. But you can probably think of another example of somewhere where you really should not trust them. The whole point is they're really good at making things up. Just don't believe them. Here's another one. Court jester. When you just want fun, where you want um, chat GPT to suggest prompts that you can then insert into Dali to create images for your PowerPoint slides, or just goofing off, or you just want to break silly conversations. You know, give me a haiku about me doing my homework. Really good for that, really useless for research design and literature reviews. That's kind of like Ace Ventura, pet detective. You know, if there's a real murder, you want Sherlock Holmes. You really don't want Ace Ventura. If you want a laugh, um, then a court jester can be really good. Nice break. So why do people use these metaphors? Um, it's different aspects of understanding. It's like, what the hell is this new thing called chat GPT? Some sense of how it works, but more importantly, if you're not a computer scientist, you might not care too much about how it works, but you really do care about, well, what is it for? Um, what might it be used for? What could I use it for? Um, what are the things that I ought to think twice about asking it for? Now, if I start to think of it, oh, it's like Ace Ventura, I'm probably not going to ask it for medical advice. Um, so it can be a useful inoculation against inappropriate use, as well as suggestions for more creative use. And again, thinking in the future, what might it be used for? That's what all these people in Silicon Valley are thinking, what the hell can we use this for? How can we make money out of it? Some of the ideas will work, some of them will fail, some of them will be catastrophically awful. Um, so they're all vital in teaching about what the hell is chat GPT. And that might be me as a professor teaching a bunch of students, you trying to explain to your family members what this thing is that they've heard about. And you're at university, please explain it to your grandma. Um, so use of metaphors can be very handy. Um, there's the metaphors that we know about, but then there's some other ones. So if you're ever doing this explaining, listen to what other people use to describe it, how they currently understand, and think about the ones that you currently choose to use, maybe the ones that you've used to explain large language models to yourself when you first encountered them, which ones have you used to explain to other people that seem to work very well, where people say, oh, I get it now. Uh, and again, in our conversation, I might invite you to suggest the ones that you've used that seem to work really well, the ones you use that really did not work at all. Um, having a repertoire of metaphors can really help in your explaining. So can it help to sort of clarify or just to give a different perspective and to help uh, explain appropriate use? Here's one I made up. I'm saying, well, I, I think it's useful to think of ChatGPT as the banalatron. So that is obviously, it's a device, it generates banal answers. The reason I invented that word is it's not like a person. It's not like your secretary or Sherlock Holmes or even Dr. Watson. It's a robot and it generates banal stuff. And of course it works because that's how large language models work. They collect all the words data, find the most likely thing, the most banal thing. That's not necessarily a bad thing. If you want to know, you know what the average is that lots of people were talking about in the data set it came from, it will give you, here's what the average people say about it. And now can you do something different? So it's just to reassure you that that horrible metaphor, artificial intelligence, well, I agree with the artificial. I'm not too sure about the intelligence side. It's plausible. It looks like it's intelligence. It's like, you know, stage magicians who saw a lady in half. They're not really sawing a lady in half. And if we're not careful, uh, a lot of people will say, oh, chat GPT, it's like magic, isn't it? That's a metaphor, not a very helpful one. Um, so, you know, with Q&A, when I've talked to people about this, they say, oh, I get this metaphor thing. That sounds really exciting. Yeah, but I think I'm using the wrong metaphor. Please tell me, Mike, what is the one right metaphor I should give my class? 
And the answer is there isn't one. Um, different metaphors for different people at different times in their lives for different purposes. So sorry, you need lots of them. Um, the good news is multiple mixed metaphors help illuminate different aspects of the problem. And in studies we've done um, about people's use of uh, metaphors when they're looking at things like Amazon Alexa, Google Home, um, people spontaneously use lots of metaphors depending on the context that they're using Alexa for. And sometimes even they use two different metaphors in the same sentence. So people seem to be quite comfortable using multiple metaphors to make sense of a technology. And I'll just point that out. That is completely different to what you learn in your creative writing class, where we say, oh, mixed metaphors, they're really bad. Apparently, when it comes to understanding te technology, mixed metaphors are really good. So we can mix and match. So because of all that, we then have these sort of bigger issues. What we're going to do once we've given people the metaphors and they can think about it, we can think about teaching about large language models. That's what I've been talking about. Um, we can be teaching with large language models around or teaching using large language models um, that other people are talking about. And I'll just sort of wrap up with this, you know, that when you're talking to a student and they say, oh, I use chat GPT, what's wrong with that? And I think, well, you know, you thought you were getting Dr. Watson to write your homework for you, but I think you ended up with Ace Ventura. And what, they, what it's produced is absolute rubbish. Do you see why? Um, so if the student believes that large language models are truly intelligent and it's given what they think is an intelligent answer, they might be horrified that you're just being mean when you criticize what they come up with. So I will wrap up then uh, and I encourage you in the Q&A to share metaphors that you've used, metaphors that were useful to you in explaining and any other metaphors that people can generate now that might help in understanding some aspect of large language models. So that's me done. Um, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Twydale. Um, if Dr. Shayan Durudi is ready with his presentation, we can get started with that. Sure. Thank you so much. And, and um, I'm excited to go after these two great talks. Um, I mean, partially, I mean, maybe I shouldn't be excited because it's hard to follow up, but, but I can at least build on some of the things that have already been discussed. So um, I really like this discussion on metaphors because I think what I wanted to lead with I also don't have a formal presentation. I want, want it to be a little bit interactive if we can. But one of the things I want to lead with is that as educators, we need to understand to some extent, I don't know, maybe we'll clarify to what extent, uh, the AI tools, these AI tools, um, in order to understand how to effectively use them to enact different pedagogical practices. And I think metaphors is a great way. Like we don't need to understand necessarily in detail how the, the AI is working, how the, the machine learning that leads to that and all the technical details. Um, but we need to understand what the limitations and the capabilities are. and you know, we can understand maybe maybe in the previous session, although I missed that session, you know, we, we got some information about that, but I think um, it's going to be somewhat situation specific, right? So if we want to use, we might look at one of these tools like ChatGPT and say, oh, we can do something really creative with it. We can use it to do some kind of, um, I don't know, collaborative learning exercise or something that, that you really want to do in your classroom. Maybe you're already trying to do those kind of things, but you, you're looking at a new way to do that. It might give you know, it might give the impression that it can be used for that because, you know, uh, you know, it seems like it can. But as we saw in the previous talk, sometimes it might not act the ways that we think it will. Right. And so using these kind of metaphors, seeing if they align with the, the pedagogy we're trying to use, seeing if the limitations and the capabilities align, uh, I think is really important. And in the keynote talk this morning, uh, Kristen De Serbo talked about, for example, using these kind of tools for uh, critical thinking and things like that. I'm not saying they can't be used for that, but I think we should think about, you know, if we're going to use it for that purpose. What are the what are the pros and cons? Like, you know, will it foster critical thinking? What might go wrong in that situation? And understanding the AI tool can help us see what's going to happen in that particular situation. So, in the whole context of tutoring, um, you know, we saw the example of Conmigo. I mean, I think there could be great prospects with that, but I have some hesitations, right? Because it's as we've seen and we've heard many times, it can hallucinate things. It can suddenly start doing the wrong thing. Maybe it starts acting as Ace Ventura in the middle of a tutoring session, right? We don't expect that from human tutors. And one of the things is. And, and, one may, maybe useful metaphor is to think about other AI technologies. I think that one of the issues with AI is even if it's very accurate, even if it's very sophisticated, which ChatGPT is in many ways, at least sophisticated, if not accurate, uh, that might not be enough because it gives it gives us the impression that it's a human when it's really not, right? And we've, we've seen this with self-driving cars. So maybe we can use that as a metaphor here. With self-driving cars, they can actually be quite accurate. I mean, at least they claim that I haven't followed up with it, but maybe 10 years ago when there was a lot of news about it, they claimed that you know they won't get into accidents and this and that. Even if that's true, one of the issues is if we're driving in a street with self-driving cars, we expect them to act like human drivers. Human drivers are not perfect. We know that. 
you know, I'm not a great driver, right? So we're not perfect, but at least we sort of know how human drivers work. We don't know what a self-driving car is. And I've seen some Teslas like do some maneuvers. And at first I'm like, that's weird. And then I'm like, maybe it's uh, you know, the self-driving aspect of it, right? And so when we're immersed in, a, in an place where we expect someone to act human-like or sorry, some something to act human-like, uh, we might be misled when it doesn't, right? So when, we're, when we have a tutor, you know, the tutor might be able to, you know, give really good answers and have some really good, uh, you know, dialogue. But then sometimes it might do something wrong or weird, but sound really human-like still, right? At least when a human makes a mistake, maybe we sort of understand that. Maybe the human will own up to its mistake. Uh, I don't know how many of you have tried ChatGPT when you say, oh, you made a mistake. And it's like, sorry, it's very polite too. It apologizes and then repeats the same thing or it changes the wrong thing, right? And it keeps doing that. Sometimes I've like told them many times, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. And they'll keep repeating the same thing. That's not a behavior a human would do. Even, even a fairly ignorant human would not have that behavior, right? And so we, we need to, you know, maybe just be even playing around with these tools, trying to understand what are the limitations when we're trying to use it in a certain way. And to give a counter example, uh, uh, for example, so when we talk about different pedagogical practices, instead of tutoring, one thing we're thinking about in our lab is, well, what if we have ChatGPT act as a student, right? Again, it won't act as a perfect student, but one of the things is students make mistakes. Uh, so, and ChatGPT makes mistakes and they might not be the same mistakes, but why would we even want it to act as a student? There could be various reasons. Uh, I know some, some researchers at Stanford are looking at using it as a way for, to help TAs, train TAs, so a TA can, um, you know, interact with ChatGPT students uh, in order to sort of simulate office hours, right? So to prepare them for what would happen in real office hours, right? So it could be used as a training tool. And I think that's an interesting thing to think about. In that situation, it's okay if ChatGPT starts hallucinating, because, you know, maybe a student comes to your office hour and starts acting up. What do you do in that situation? You know, so that might actually be okay, right? Uh, and, and, you know, maybe not the ideal office hours, right? But, 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 you know, the mistakes it makes might not be that concerning as it is if it was acting as a tutor. What we're thinking about in our lab is, is what if we can act, have an act as a student so the real student can actually learn by teaching it, right? So can we teach ChatGPT, right? Uh, and in this way, we can think about, okay, ChatGPT, it's not a human, uh, you know, it might act in weird ways, but it's still somewhat sort of a cognitive agent. At least, it, you know, it gives the impression that it's being cognitive, right? And so one aspect of a cognitive agent is that it can potentially learn new things. So can we try to teach it and thereby learn by teaching? Those are, I mean, most people here imagine are educators. We can probably all attest to the fact that we actually learn things better when we have to teach it. Uh, we learn things more deeply. And so can we leverage that idea to create a pedagog pedagogical situation where students have to learn by teaching? Uh, and in this case, if they teach something wrong, they're at least not, you know, hurting the students that they're teaching because it's, a, you know, it's an AI, it's not an actual person. Um, and hopefully, maybe, you know, maybe they'll learn something in the process. We haven't tested this idea, but I mean, we haven't tested in a sense with real students. Hopefully we will soon, but I can at least give a quick uh, demo of what this might look like. Um, and this is just one example. There's actually many ways you can potentially do this. I'll just share one uh, possible example. So here, um, as you see in the prompt below, I say, pretend you are a student. Uh, and I'm going to teach it a new mathematical operator. It's called the Dairy Dairy, um, which is actually, you might guess what, what I'm actually teaching. I'm actually teaching derivative. So what I'm doing here is I change the name because ChatGPT, if you say derivative, it's going to know what it is. It's going to, you know, start talking about derivatives, but I'm going to call it something else. So it doesn't know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to see if I can actually teach it this operator. I'll skip around a little bit. Um, so we can teach how to do the Dairy Dairy of a polynomial. I actually describe in, in you know, human language, what the algorithm is for doing that. We replace the coefficient by the exponent of that term. We decrement the value of the exponent by one. And if, you, if you're familiar with calculus, which I imagine many of you are, you can tell me if that's correct or not. It's actually not correct. But it learns the correct, incorrect procedure. It, le it learns the incorrect procedure that I taught it, which is good, it's learning, right? Um, and, but then maybe the student would realize at some point, wait, that's not the right answer, right? So maybe I, I know how to take a derivative, but I don't know how to articulate it you know, properly, and then I have to, you know, correct myself, right? Um, so, you know, I'll skip around here. Um, it got the correct answer according to the procedure I taught it. I asked it to simplify the ex expression. It did that correctly. And, but if it made a mistake, I could also tell it, oh, you made a mistake. Here's maybe what you did wrong, right? As a teacher, you should be able to do that. Then here I'm saying I realized the mistake I made, which I actually knew ahead of time. I was just playing with it. Uh, and I teach it the correct rule. And what's really fascinating is it actually now learns how to do the correct procedure. And so even though ChatGPT knows how to, well, it doesn't really, but it can often, if you ask it, it would take the derivative of something, it might often give the right answer. Here, I'm you know, pretending I'm teaching something else, and then I can do this exploration of, can I learn by teaching uh, this, this agent? So hopefully that makes the idea clear.
Um, and this is just one example, right? So there's many ways we can use these tools in new pedagogical ways. But I think the important thing is, again, to think about the affordances of these tools uh, and, and where they might go wrong, right? And even in this situation, there might be places where it can go wrong, right? Um, for example, one of my students pointed out, what if I, um, you, know, you know, we were trying to see if, well, we have the student use the word derivative and we use some tool to automatically swap it with some other term. What if I'm trying to use derivative in another sense of the term and that gets swapped and the whole conversation can go awry, right? Um, or for example, we're trying to teach limits and then I say, um, you know, I have a limited amount of time and then, and then that term gets swapped with something else. And then, you know, so there, there's all, all, all sorts of issues to think through when using these tools. But um, I just, you know, and I'm not saying what is the correct way to use it. And I think that's going to be situation specific. Um, but if we do want to use it, we should be thinking about how it aligns with the pedagogical practices. So I don't have too much time. Uh, I have a couple of minutes. Um, uh, well, I guess one thing to, to end off on is, you know, I talked about understanding these tools, um, but we should also understand that using AI in education is not new, right? And so uh, one of my research interests has been understanding the history of AI in education. This history dates back to the 1960s, or actually in, in some sense, the 1950s with the start of AI. Actually, the very early days of AI, people are interested in exploring uh, its, its use in education, uh, its relationship with education. So the new tools we have now with ChatGPT, it, it opens new possibilities. It's quite different from previous AI, but I think we can learn a lot by actually looking at what people have done in the past. People have been trying to create AI tutors for many years. ChatGPT-based AI tutors are gonna look very different. Large language uh, models look very different from the ways that people have previously done it, but we can still learn from efforts that people have previously done. In some cases, don't, so those might have affordances the large language models don't. So if you're getting excited about using AI in education, one thing to think about is large language models aren't the only thing, right? They're not the only approach. They're good for certain purposes and, and maybe bad for others. And we can look at other approaches. Uh, one tool that we're exploring, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Alex. It's a tutoring system used in math. Uh, maybe some of you use it, if, if we have any math educators. Um, you can raise your hands. Okay, we have at least one hand. Um, a few people, okay. So one thing we're looking at is with Alex as well, how do we use Alex in a way that supports teachers' pedagogical practices? So we can ask these questions with other AI tools as well, and the, the ways we answer them might be different. Um, but you know, at least I'd like to end off with just encouraging you to look back at earlier tours, tools, look back at earlier metaphors, right? And, and some other metaphors um, or some other examples in the history of technology we can look at is the internet, for example. When the internet came around, there's so much excitement about like education is going to change, hyperlinking is going to change how we navigate things in the world. It didn't change how we teach by and large. It does change, it did change how we interact with knowledge. You know, there's been studies showing our memory is now decreased because we rely on the internet. I think we're going to see similar things with large language models. It's going to change how students interact with knowledge, even if it doesn't by and large change how we teach. But as educators, we should be thinking about these things ahead of the curve before suddenly the world changes and we don't know what to do with that. So I'll end with that. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Dr. Durudi. Um, I think, I think that brings our speaker presentations to an end. Um, I'm sure our, our, our audience found, um, the presentations really insightful and, and informative. We'll now jump into a brief discussion with our two student panelists on this panel, um, Lily Lee and Vinita Marupeddi. Um, so I, I, I just have a couple questions to ask the two of you. Um, first, I'd like to ask about your personal experience as college students using AI resources. I think to give everyone here like a better sense of how we as students use these tools. Um, could you talk a bit about how your experience has been using these tools, whether you use it for assignments or to study for exams or maybe both, and how accurate were the responses you received and like just in general, how do you individually approach the process of using these AI tools? Sure, I can begin. So I'm an engineering student and I had a chance to use AI this past school year uh, for my material science class. My professor actually allowed us to use these AI tools. He encouraged us to use ChatGPT as a bouncing off point, as Professor Powell said, um, as a way to come up with ideas of different materials we can um, study deeper upon. But we couldn't use ChatGPT to actually do that deep research. We would have to use academic tools to actually go further in our research. So it was a great starting point to come up with ideas for our final reports. Similar to Lily, I use ChatGPT for understanding concepts specifically. So if there's like a machine learning concept that I don't understand, 
I'll have ChatGPT explain what I need to know in order to understand that one concept. And then it will give me those list of um, topics that I need to go over. And if I don't understand those individually, I'll have it explain them in a way that like a kindergartner would understand. So I ensure that I understand it fully. Great, um, th thank you for that. Um, now, the second question I'd, I'd like to ask here is uh, for your thoughts on how educators might consider um, academic integrity policies when it comes to the use of AI. Um, since this is still a relatively new domain, um, I'd say there aren't too many comp comprehensive guidelines about the boundary about say the boundaries of plagiarism when it comes to AI. For example, if you use ChatGPT to edit some code or maybe write some code for you, um, then how does plagiarism really come to play here? Like what counts as an unethical practice and what doesn't, right? So how do you as college students feel that it would be best to approach this in a way that keeps a check on the use of AI tools uh, without like sort of stunting the learning experience for college students? I think it's most important for our teachers to be transparent from the beginning. When I did that material science project, my teacher was very well educated with how ChatGPT works. And so he was able to put in like guidelines for how we use it. I think also I would encourage teachers to come up with projects and assignments where students have to rely more on like less on ChatGPT and more on their own creativity so that they're not doing everything out of ChatGPT. I also think maybe having students say whether they used any sort of AI in their assignments would be helpful, just like if they used code that was written by ChatGPT or something, just saying that it's AI assisted code. Also, I, I think it's really important for educators to also incorporate some sort of AI into their assignments, like if they can allow students to use these tools because they're probably gonna have access to them in the real world. If they can have students use them in assignments, they'll have like a better understanding of the tools that are available to them and how to use these tools in the real world. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that brings our brief um, student panelist discussion to a close. And now, as we promised, we'll move to um, Q&A for our, our speakers here. Um, so we've collected a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and I'll just ask the, the top questions that we have to our speakers and they can jump in as and when they feel um, that they would be best suited to answer a question. So um, the first question we have here is that a speaker in a previous session said that LLMs are not a fundamentally new technology and their recent successes are largely based on advances in computational power and access to large data sets. Do you agree? And if so, are these advances sufficient to really power the kinds of changes and tools that are being predicted and sold? Okay, so I'll, I'll hit that one. Um, so first of all, remember, if you, anytime you ask, uh, uh, say, 10 faculty about their opinion or something, you will get 20 opinions. So let me agree and disagree. Um, f uh, so uh, I, I think uh, uh, Julia Hockemeyer was 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 pointing out the fact that um, uh, these advances, this sudden step change in what and and the, you know the, the mere fact that this conference exists, um, uh, there are changes, but it's not like there's been a tremendous. Uh, change in say the mathematical structures of, of these we've discovered transformers we've discovered that if we put a million dollars worth of computing into this stuff that we can start to see some interesting things and so then we put two million and then we put ten million dollars etc and so so actually the advances have come from uh just sheer brute force compute power uh and over sheer brute force data which has been available because we have this wonderful thing called the internet um, and let's not worry too much about things like licensing and then, you know, other, other kind of minor issues and legal issues, etc. Let's just run as fast as we can, because that's what computer science tends to do. Um, uh, never mind security, never mind, right, right, we, 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 we see this low hanging fruit and we, we run after it. Um, so I, I think Julie didn't have enough time to kind of go into all the, the, those points. I know she has a much more kind of a nuanced uh, understanding of this. Um, so I... But but may I may I kind of just jump into something else we talked about, which was um, how we use these tools, um, because uh, you're right that there's not that much yet about kind of things like what to add to syllabus. But there are things 
Um, so let me just find that. You should be able to see my screen. So for example, uh, uh, UMN has uh, these kind of suggestions about things that instructors, educators might want to put into their syllabus. So the suggestion is that we need to be explicit today about whether we expect our students to, to use these tools or not. Um, and of course, bear in mind that if, you're, if what you're asking students appears to be busy work, in other words, if I can answer this question in 30 seconds using chat GPT, students are probably not gonna follow your directions. But anyway, that aside, um, we need to think about things like, uh, should AI tools be used to summarize items? And bear in mind as well that uh, the directions you give uh, may be biased against people who perhaps don't have English as their first language. Uh, so uh, things like Grammarly, uh, other tools which are very useful for people that are learning English or um, say have dyslexia, um, uh, might be uh, unfairly biased against if, if, you're, if you say, no, I'm only going to accept things which are you know, typed out by you or written out by you in longhand etc. So, so, so think about these things caref carefully. Um, I personally think uh, as educators, one way we should approach this is to say that the output from these tools should be the new blank page, should be the new fail almost, should be like the new minimum uh, of, of, of what we expect of our students. Uh, because anybody else at any other university or in a commercial setting or whatever can now produce something. It may not be secure. It may not be accurate. It may not keep that bridge up for you know, hours uh, or days or years, but it is something. Uh, and, and so, so uh, I think in terms of our expectations to students, we need to say, no, you need to do more. And therefore, you need to be more of an expert than ChatGPT, which is you know, spitting out stochastic text. Um, anyway, so I'll, I'll stop there because I know we've got other questions to get to. Thank you for your answer. Um, so I think that the next um, question we have here is, you all recommend faculty actually use these tools in order to better understand their strengths and weaknesses. Can you recommend a gateway exercise for STEM faculty who have been reluctant to get their feet wet? So one thing, of course, is you could always ask ChatGPT to answer your assignments and see what comes out. Um, and that can be quite revealing. Um, also, um, you might do that first privately, but then do it with your class and say, you know, as Lauren said, well, that's the baseline. That's what the robot can do. Now, prove to me you're better than a robot. Um, so you can use ChatGP to establish like, you know, this is the minimum. Um, this is what you, you know, any old machine can do. Um, why would anybody pay you to do something as a human being when we can get a robot to do that for free? Um, and, you know, it's similar to what we often do at university is <laughs> we say, well, you know, um, you're going to be competing um, with lots of other people um, for jobs in the future. So you need to sort of show your, uh, you know, your flexibility uh, and ability to cope with things and come up with new solutions to problems because we've already tried all the obvious stuff. So don't tell me the obvious stuff. Uh, move on from that. Now we're also, as well as competing with other human beings, we're going to be competing with robots. Um, and I have every confidence we can teach our students to be smarter than a robot. I was shocked um, when I asked it an exam question where the rubric, where I said, okay, 10 points will be awarded for this and, and for that and that, uh, led to it actually basically generating a perfect answer. Uh, and it was the rubric, the, the, the specific 10 points um, the, that actually led to it generating the right output. There's been other times when it just produced crud and it, it, it was like a, a symphony that never got started. It was just like, hey, let's make this function and let's make that function. And it never actually got to the point. Uh, there's been other times when it refused to answer because my question happened to be about cryptography and chat GPT-4 and chat GPT-3 are, are very reluctant to go into some areas. Bear in mind that some students will be running local models and different models. And, and so now you're setting up an inequity if you simply think that, that, uh, assert, that, uh, that, that, that your students are only using one kind of one form. Um, and um, what's the other quick thing? Yes, bear in mind that... Um, that this idea of using a rubric is actually very similar to kind of test-driven development. So I'm excited about the idea of using these tools by saying, you know, a good answer will cover blah, 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 and blah, blah, right? It was that we're actually starting to write a specification or a declaration of what makes a good answer. And then these tools can spit out something. Um, and so, yeah, we need all to become like careful critics and, and to understand uh, whether it's a good, good data or, or, or not. 
Um, in STEM, you can actually, uh, one fun thing, by the way, is to ask these models to reverse a sentence. Um, it does poorly because uh, it's, they're, they're currently based on, on uh, symbols. Um, and, and so the, the, the amusing part is that the, the, the sentence is often corrupted in the middle um, once it gets long enough. Um, but you ask it to reverse that and it comes back to the original one. Um, and so there are these kind of amusing things where it starts to fail. Another example, by the way, is if you go to a slight delta away from its training data, um, perhaps you know the Monty, Monty Hall problem where uh, the presenter knows which door the, the car is, is hiding behind, right? Um, and you can describe the situation where it says, uh, the doors are glass. Right, uh, and 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 so actually, it's very clear that you can you can see the car is behind door two, right? But the the model goes, oh yeah, this is clearly the the Monty Hall problem. You should change doors, right? Um, and and so these these tools do have their Achilles heels, and I think part of our responsibility, um, at least in twelve months' time, I don't think we know today, is to truly understand uh, how and when these 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 models fail. Uh, to date, we have lots of Achilles heels, and we talk about things like hallucinations, and we have the little anecdotes that I just have. Um, but I think we need to have a much more um, nuanced understanding of, of, of what these models uh, can and, and can't do. Um, okay, um, thank you for your, for your responses. I think we are at time, so I think I'll um, just bring our panel to a quick conclusion here. Um, first of all, thank you to all our speakers for taking out their time today and um, presenting and answering questions from our audience. Um, I'm sure your, your insights were really um, valuable. Um, I just have two last points to mention. One is that um, our panels are quite short. So if, if anyone still has questions, um, they can join our networking and brainstorming session, which in fact starts at 2 p.m. Um, just in 10 minutes from now where they will have the opportunity to brainstorm and network with the speakers and, and other edu um, educators afterwards. Um, and if they have any follow-up questions, I'm sure they can reach out to the speakers um, following this conference. And um, finally, we will have a conference report and a recording of all the sessions that will be sent out um, that should summarize all the takeaways from our sessions. And um, the questions people have asked in the Q&A have also been recorded, and we'll try to follow up as best as we can in the conference report. Um, yeah, I think that's that brings our panel to a close today. Thank you to everyone who joined our session, and have a nice day.